This is Agriculture Today, and I'm Shelby Varner with the K-State Radio Network. This Wednesday show begins with Chris Thurston and Josh Ritter from the Kansas Farm Service Agency. Chris gives a brief update about ongoing programs, and Josh reiterates the Youth Loan Program and Direct Farm Operating Loan. Kate State Watershed Specialist Stacy Minson and Herschel George continue the show by talking about upcoming field days. The days are intended to inform producers about what they can do for water quality and supply. Rounding out today's show is the Beef Cattle Institute's Ask the Experts. Brad White, Brian Lubers, and Bob Larson discuss factors for producers to consider when choosing the length of their breeding season. That and more is coming up ahead on Agriculture Today. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we begin our Wednesday show this week with information from the Kansas Farm Service Agency. And this week, we're joined by Chris Thurston, Kansas Farm Service Agency State Outreach Coordinator, and Josh Ritter, Farm Loan Chief. We're first going to get started with Chris. So, Chris, thanks for joining us today. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate you inviting me. And so, Chris, first getting started off with conservation, something important to Kansas Farm Service Agency. What are the different programs going on? So currently there's three successful programs, uh, general CRP, grassland CRP, and our continuous CRP. And with that, usually might involve some payouts, and the Conservation Price Support Division has made payouts this year. Yeah, currently about $85.2 million, uh, $73.9 million to the Conservation Reserve Program, CRP, about $7.2 million in uh, Emergency Conservation Program, ECP, and about $4.1 million in dairy margin coverage. So when are these payouts normally made? Typically, they're made in October. With these, a lot of different programs, as many times, a lot of different acronyms that go with the Kansas Farm Service Agency. And so if they want to find out some more about these programs, where can they do that? Basically, they need to reach out to their local county office, uh, County FSA Service Center, for more information. And Chris, still a newer program that has come out that you wanted to share a little bit more information about. Uh, The new program is a discrimination financial assistance program. Uh, It's been authorized by Section 22007 of the Inflation Reduction Act. And basically that's going to provide financial assistance to farmers, ranchers, and forest landowners who experienced discrimination in USDA farm lending programs prior to 2021. And what is the deadline for that program for people? So the application period is currently open, uh, but applications will close on October the 31st of this year. So let's make sure you get a chance to take a look at that right away. Because as always, it's not a good idea to wait till the last second. That's correct. And if people are wanting to find out more information about this program, where can they do that? Well, if you think you might be eligible, we encourage you to check out the program's website at www.22007apply.gov. So 22007apply.gov. And at that place, you'll find a bunch of assistance. Uh, You can learn about the program, and there'll be some ways to help you to apply. You can get online, phone, or in-person help. And as always, I will link all these resources in today's show notes on agtoday.net. Chris, I appreciate you joining us today and sharing with us some information from the Farm Service Agency. Thanks, Shelby. I appreciate it. That was Kansas Farm Service Agency State Outreach Coordinator Chris Thurston. We're now joined by Kansas FSA Farm Loan Chief Josh Ritter as he shares some information with us about the Farm Operating Loan. We have a direct farm operating loan program, and really with this program, these are funded directly through FSA to the producer, and then FSA is going to make and service that loan. So the producer will be working directly with FSA on these loans. And the main objective of the farm, direct farm operating loan program is to use that program to finance any farm operating expenses that a customer might have, a producer might need. And so real fast on loans, it's not going through a bank, it's going through the Farm Service Agency. Correct. The, our direct loan programs are directly through Farm Service Agency. And so talking a little bit more about this, when you say the program is used to finance farm operating expenses, what is that exactly? Yeah, that's that's a fair point. And they can really be used for a variety of different purposes. Uh, One of the primary purposes is to purchase machinery, equipment, and or livestock that are necessary for the farm operation. Uh, The program can also be used to finance annual operating expenses that would include feed, seed, fertilizer, pesticides, farm supplies, and cash rent payments. Then we can also use the program for costs associated with reorganizing a farm to improve profitability. 
A common example of this is to purchase equipment needed to convert from uh, conventional practice to no-till production. And then there's also the, the last way is that the program, we can use it to refinance non-real estate farm-related debts. So that's any any debt that's farm-related but doesn't deal directly with real estate. So there's really several different ways that producers can take advantage of our operating loan program to help expand their operation and improve profitability. So for farms, this is for possibly ones that focus on crops or livestock. It's really not either way, but can be anything agriculture related. Correct. Yeah, yeah they can be used for, for either livestock or crop production or, you know, e- even things outside the box, too. I mean, we're kind of kind of opening it up to different avenues, too. So And so obviously a loan deals with finances. So what are some important information when considering that? Yeah, I think the first thing I want to point out is that the maximum loan amount available under this program is $400,000. That's a cumulative total. So if a producer has an outstanding $200,000 operating loan, then they could apply for another direct operating loan for up to an additional $200,000. The repayment terms vary based on what the loan purpose is, but they'll never exceed seven years under this program. Generally, annual operating loans are repaid within 12 months or when the commodities produced are sold. Uh, currently, the interest rate on the program is 4.5%. That interest rate does adjust monthly, but once the loan is closed, that interest rate will be fixed for the life of the loan. And Josh, once you make that loan, is that interest rate locked in? Correct. Yep. Once the borrowers, once we made that loan to the borrower, that interest rate that they they're locked in at that in, their interest rate for the life of the loan. And something I want to clarify here, Josh, is that this loan can be used with other FSA loans. And so if you have one loan already with the Kansas Farm Service Agency, you can have another? Correct. Yeah. yeah. And really on the the direct side, we have two main programs, which are our operating loans, what we're talking about today, and our farm ownership loans. And those farm ownership loans are basically our real estate purchase loans. So what are some other requirements that producers have to meet to be eligible for FFSA's Direct Farm Operating Loan Program? There, There's really a lot of different eligibility criteria that producers will need to work through with their local office, but uh, there are a couple things to keep in mind. And I think, you know, the, the first one is if a producer can obtain sufficient credit elsewhere at reasonable rates and terms, then they're not going to be eligible to work. Uh, with FSA for a direct loan. So we're, our direct program doesn't compete with commercial lenders. Also, our direct operating loans require applicants to have sufficient education, training, or at least one year's experience in managing or operating the farm to be eligible. Uh, to meet this requirement through education, the applicant needs to have completed an educational program in agriculture. Uh, that would include either a two- or four-year degree from a college in ag business, horticulture, animal science, agronomy, or any other ag-related field. Uh, to meet the requirement through farm experience, the applicant has to have been an owner, manager, or operator of a farm business for at least one entire production cycle. Uh, generally, the easiest way to show that is through production records and income and expense records like a Schedule F from a tax return. And something cool that you mentioned before we got started was the FSA Youth Loan Program. Could you tell us a bit about what that is? Yeah, for sure. Um, we do have a youth loan program that's available to kids and young adults between the ages of 10 and 20. The maximum loan amount for that program is $5,000. The Youth Loan Project has to provide an opportunity for the young person to acquire experience and education in agriculture-related skills, and the project needs to be sponsored by an advisor such as a 4-H club, FFA, tribal youth organization, or similar similar agriculture-affiliated group. The program offers, I think, a great avenue for for kids and younger adults to become familiar with the loan-making process and get experience with financial management with the help of an advisor. And a lot of these times the program is going to be used for a fair project and gives the opportunity for some kids to buy a steer heifer or pig, you know, something like that, that they otherwise wouldn't be able to afford to do so. So I think, you know, it's a a really fun program. It's fun for the kids to get involved and and be able to to get that finance they need to get a project started for either 4-H or FFA. And is that something that even if the parents aren't involved with FSA, that the youth could still participate in? For sure. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And is that once again just going to your local FSA office and walking through all the details of that? Yeah, it, it would be, and it's it's really quite a bit uh, shorter process, an application process, since we're not dealing with you know quite quite so big a dollar figure. So it's it's a pretty simple process for those kids to kind of go through. And I know a lot of times in the past we've talked about the FSA things, and a lot of times they have a deadline to them, but these programs don't. They're kind of a year-round thing whenever you're ready to do it. Correct. Yeah, you're, you're right. Like on our farm program side, we do deal with hard deadlines quite a bit, but but with our farm loans, yep, no, there are no, no deadlines whenever you need the financing come in and apply. Uh, 
sometimes we have in the past we've had funding issues where we run out of funds uh, as we wait for a new budget, but that hasn't been an issue for quite some time now, and it looks like we have uh, good, good funding to finish out this year for sure. So I would encourage everybody to come on in and apply if they're interested. And if someone is interested in the farm operating loan or the youth loan program or really anything else FSA has to offer, where could they find out more information? Yeah, I think the first place I would tell anybody interested in our farm loan program to do is to contact their local farm loan office and speak with one of our farm loan employees directly. We do have 21 farm loan offices in Kansas. You know, if you're not familiar with where those are located, uh, just go to whichever local FSA office you work with, and they'll be able to point you in the right direction and, and get you any information you might need uh, moving forward there. And additionally, you know, we're kind of obviously in person, we, we love it, but we're also kind of moving more toward towards some online stuff too. And there is a lot of information on farmers.gov regarding uh, farm loan programs available through FSA. Uh, that website does include information on our loan programs and also a loan assistance tool that explains the various loan options to users and also provides some guidance on how eligibility is determined uh, for FSA loans. Uh, in order to directly access that farm, the farm loan tools available through Farmers.gov, a person needs to go to www.farmers.gov and backslash loans. A lot of information there. Josh, I appreciate you coming in and sharing it with us. Thank you. I appreciate your time. That was Kansas Farm Service Agency Farm Loan Chief Josh Ritter. You can find more information about FSA programs by going to www.farmers.gov. I will link that in today's show notes, which, as always, you can find on agtoday.net. We're cutting to a short break now on Agriculture Today, but we'll be back with more ahead. are tuned back into Agriculture Today, and we continue our show now discussing an upcoming field day. And in to talk about this field day, we have Key State Watershed Specialist Stacy Minson and Herschel George. Stacy Herschel, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks. This upcoming field day taking place in western Kansas, and it's titled, Are You in the Mood for Livestock Watering Options? And so, Stacy, what does this field day really encapsulate? Well, for Herschel and I and our counterparts, the rest of the watershed specialist team is just making county agents, NRCS staff, personnel, RAPS coordinators, watershed restoration and protection strategy coordinators, and then local county producers, farmers, ranchers of options for alternative water supplies. So our ultimate goal is to keep cattle out of the creeks for their water source. So we want to give them the alternative options to protect our water supplies. Sounds like kind of helping create that solution for producers and other people to help teach it. And so this is a two-day event. You can come to either day or both days, however you're feeling, because what's happening those days is different. So what's taking place? On Tuesday, later in the afternoon, we start at 3.30 on Tuesday, August 22nd. We're going to look at an alternative water supply coming off of Big Creek. So we've drilled a well so the cattle aren't drinking out of Big Creek. Really, we've created a wet well out of this site and uh, going to use that wet well as a water supply for a cow herd. And so we're just going to utilize the water in Big Creek and then put it into a tank and the cattle will have access to it using the same water supply, but we're not allowing them to be in the creek encouraging nitrogen, bacteria, sediment in the creek. So we're improving the water in a sense, and that's our ultimate goal with it. Um, So we'll show that, and then we're also going to look at another option. That day, we're actually going to install a tire tank. So we're going to take a tire, we're going to cut it, we're going to show you how to do that so you can pipe into that tank for the water supply. We have a lot of farmers and ranchers that have access to tires. You can buy the large ones, or you can take some that you have on the farm, old equipment tires, cut them. The tire's going to be here for a lot longer than all of us. And it's a, it's a very durable water supply. So we will actually show how we do that from cutting it, pouring the concrete, leveling it, and putting the pipes in. And we'll cover it with a couple inches of water, but it won't be completely full per se, because we need it to set. And so at this event, not just talking about what's happening, but actually showing how to do it. Yeah, we'll be uh, getting the 
reciprocating saw out and cutting the top out of that uh, combine tire. We'll be setting the tank. We'll be pouring the concrete, you know, mixing the uh, sackcrete to make concrete and to put in it. And then, yeah, as Stacy said, we will put two inches of water on top of it while it cures there for the next week. On this flyer, which I'll link in today's show notes, sounds like some more things also with solar panels. Yes. Yeah, so then we're going to show a different, um, this will be on Wednesday, the 23rd. We're going to show different types of solar panel systems to use for the power source to get the water out of the creeks, rivers, or even the ponds, depending upon what our source is. And then so farmers, ranchers will be able to see different size panels, different wattages and what you might need. And then um, we'll also show how we fenced off the riparian area along the creek. So we protect the bank and all of that as well. Then we'll also look at how by providing these alternative water supplies, we can allow the farmers and ranchers to actually utilize cover crops because now they have a water source so they can plant some acres to cover crops, which that's what cattle do best. They graze. If we give them the resource and the feed, we'll let them graze. We know that if we have a living root as many days out of the year, we can protect water quality that way too. Herschel, a lot of things have gone into prepping for this field day. And so what are you most excited about? I always uh, get excited about showing producers how to put in tire tanks. Tire tanks do not have to be expensive, and they're going to last a long time. And the issue is uh, just getting producers to look and watch and see how easy it is so they can replicate it when they go home. We'll give them a guideline sheet uh, It'll even have our phone number on it. So if they start building one and they say, oh, God, what do you say here? Well, dial her up and we'll talk it out and we'll figure it out so that they can put these tire tanks in themselves. That's our objective is that the producer be able to do it on their own. For people who are thinking about coming or you would encourage to come, what are you hoping they take from these field days? Our biggest thing is is letting them see that there's opportunities out there for their operation to provide that alternative water supply, to still have that herd, even in some of these drought conditions, that we can do inexpensively that allows them to keep their herd, utilize cover crops if it works in their operation, and have that long-term water supply. How do people RSVP for this event? The easiest way is just to call 785-769-3297. Or they can text, again, to 785-769-3297. That's the easiest way we'll get you in. And again, as Shelby said, you can come one day, you can come both days. The biggest thing is we want to make sure we have enough food for you so that we can provide that. Meals are included. Supper on August 22nd. We'll have snacks and things, drinks through the day. You know, sounds like long-term weather forecast is we're going to have some cooler days in August. And then we'll have lunch on the 23rd as well. Our big thing is we'll also look at an operation where we drilled a well, providing the alternative water supply. We put a pipeline to make a paddock system with a large tire tank so he can actually use over 200 acres into different smaller sections so he can let that grass rest. And in the same operation, he ended up putting some some of his own money in to put a pipeline to go to cover crops. Because, again, he had that water source so he could utilize his fields for his livestock, but also having cover out there, which we know is good for water quality as well. And this event, an opportunity for producers also just to ask questions that they have about water quality and water supply. At uh, the last site she was discussing, those are using solar to pump the water uh, out to that cover crop and for the main tank that is right there. And uh, we will be showing some solar pump equipment. If people are interested in that, we'll have two or three different setups that they can use as well as some, they can see some commercial setups there at two of the operations that we'll be visiting over the two days. And this is a free event for producers to come learn at, Yes, it's free. The other thing Herschel mentioned um, on this one operation, our other operation is, we, we made sure we put some hydrants in. We ran the pipeline so that as he expands, he's got the ability to add additional acres for cover crops or additional livestock in certain areas because we provided the one alternative water supply 
piping from a well to a tank, but we made sure it, we made it feasible and usable as his herd and operation grows so that we, we can adapt as we need to. Herschel, we've talked about a lot of different information in this interview, but why would you encourage producers to come to either both of these field days or at least one of them? Well, if they're interested in finding alternatives to what they are currently doing about watering livestock and keeping livestock away from the stream and improving water quality and good, secure water supplies, it's an opportunity to come and see and help and uh, we'll be talking about these. Uh, the producers on all these sites are real helpful and and uh, have used them to the point that they're willing to share the information with others. And uh, we welcome you to come and join us for the, the uh, meeting. I think you'll enjoy your time and uh, learn a lot. You both have shared about a lot of different information that producers can gather from these upcoming field days. However, there is another opportunity for producers to learn even more about water, possibly in a handbook that will be coming out in the next few months. Several years ago, we had uh, worked as a team to do the Livestock Watering Handbook. And so it gives all types of options, whether it's wet wells, wells, uh, ponds, creeks, rivers, whatever the water source. So we've been working on this. Our watershed specialist team has been working on this and Dr. Carol Bloxham for about a year and a half now. So part of what we're going to do, we're going to do some video. We're going to do some of this. This will be in this handbook, which will be out this fall for county extension offices in our CS personnel. And then also it'll be downloadable for anybody that wants to do that. That was K-State Watershed Specialist Stacy Minson and Herschel George discussing the upcoming field days titled, Are You in the Mood for Livestock Watering Options? These field days are taking place at the Dole Specter Conference Center in Russell, Kansas. Attendees will be traveling to fields in Russell and Ellis counties. The first field day for this event is Tuesday, August 22nd from 3.30 to dusk, and the second one is Wednesday, August 23rd from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Supper and lunch will be provided respectively, and there will be snacks and drinks throughout the event. Tire tank installation, wet wells, solar panel systems with tanks, hardened crossings, and portable water are all things that will be discussed at these field days. If you're interested in attending this free event, you can text or call 785-769-3297. Again, that is 785-769-3297. I will leave this information in today's show notes, which you can find on actoday.net. We're cutting to a short break now on Agriculture Today, but we have more for you ahead. We continue Agriculture Today with the Beef Cattle Institute's Ask the Experts. Hi, welcome to Beef Cattle Institute's Ask the Experts, where our experts will answer your questions. Happy to have you with us today and happy to have two good experts. Good morning, Brian. Morning, Brad. Bob. Good morning. So we've got a great question, and as they answer it, they get up to 10 points for their answer. To start off today, the question is from a listener who has a cow-calf operation and says, I've heard a lot about having a 60-day breeding season do I need to keep my breeding season that short? Brian, I'm going to go to you first. So I'm going to answer 60 days is ideal, but I think there are some other things that kind of come into play. And part of that is where are you an established producer? Is this an established herd or are you a new operation? And so, and part of the reason I make that distinction is because if you are a new operation, you may be trying to build a herd. You may not have quite the capital to stick to that hard 60. You may not have the luxury of selling off 10% of your herd in one season just to stick to that 60-day window. So now I do think the closer you get to that, the easier that will be to maintain long-term. And as you let those cows go later and later, then it becomes a slide for the next season and the next season. So at some point, it is ideal and probably economically and from a production standpoint, the most beneficial. But there's some trade-offs with that as far as if you don't have the capital to 
do that, you may not be able to liquidate part of your herd in one season. Okay, I, li- I like the answer, especially tailoring it towards a specific operation, right? So it, it may be different by different operations. So five points for Brian. Bob? Yeah. So I'm going to agree with Brian in that if you already have a much longer than 60-day breeding season, I would not change it to a 60-day breeding season in one year. In general, I would not do that. The interesting thing is you would think that the longer the breeding season is, the better the breed up is. And our research would actually say that's not true. That hurt. And, and again, I think it's because over time, by putting that selection pressure to only keep the cows that are going to calve early, you get rid of the cows that are a little less fertile. And, and over time, that's actually a benefit to your breed up by having a controlled breeding season. But by controlled breeding season, I'm going to actually change the words a little bit and say what I really want is a controlled calving season. So a a lot of times what I really do want is a calving season that lasts, you know, 60, 63, 65, 70 days. And you start getting longer than 70, 75 days. Now you're getting into a little longer than I would like. But I could leave the bull out longer than 60 or 70 days. And then, and a lot of times the reason is because we're talking midsummer or so is 70 days after the start of the breeding season. And I don't really want to go out and collect a bull and and get him out of the breeding pasture. And if there are some cows that get bred after that time frame, and I do a preg check in the fall, spring calving herd, then those late pregnant cows probably have more market value than an open cow. Mm -hmm. But I have to have the discipline to only keep the cows that got pregnant in the first 60 or 70 days. And I think that's my goal is if I'm longer than 60 or 70 days, give myself a few years to get there. And use use my control not on pulling the bull early, but on preg checking and only keeping the ones that conceived early. Okay, so excellent point is it's not just the breeding season. It's really the calving season that yeah. you care about. So now I'm going to ask you guys a follow-up question, and you each only get a couple seconds to respond. But why do I want it to be short? What's the advantage of me having it short? Brian, I'm going to you first. There's a couple different advantages, and I'll say one of the big ones is labor. Right. If I can focus my labor, my efforts, and even if it's just one person, stretching it out really has a toll on that individual. So I, I'm going to say the one of the big advantages to having a shorter calving season is I can manage my labor a little better. Brian's got eight points. You've got six going into the final answer. So I'm going to give you two answers. One is I'm trying to align the peak nutrient demands, which is early lactation, the first two, three months of lactation with my best grass availability. And by getting most of my cows to be right in that area where their peak lactation corresponds with my peak grass, that's a reason to have a short calving season. The other one's marketing. (laughs) The other one's marketing. Excellent. He snuck from behind nine for Bob, eight for Brian. Thanks for joining us today. If you have a question, send us at bci at ksu.edu. That was BCI's Brad White, Brian Lubers, and Bob Larson. That's all I have for you today on Agriculture Today, but we'll be back with more for you tomorrow. Tomorrow.